Thank you. Morning, everyone. Good to be with you again today. Uh, I believe God's really been speaking to us this morning. I could almost sit down. You know, if you just sort of uh, sat there and just meditated on what the Lord's been saying in the last half hour, you, uh, uh, you've got enough, really, for, to take home and, and to help you grow. But uh, I was just remembering, if you were here last week when Julian Richards was speaking, uh, I don't know if you can remember his three points. So I can't usually remember the points a week of, and a, a week afterwards. I don't know if you can. But I would recommend that you get hold of that, um, uh, that talk because uh, it was so prophetic. And there was an impartation, really, from the Holy Spirit uh, for us all. So take that on board. What, the three things that he, uh, as far as I remember, that he brought out. But he said that uh, uh, he looked at Mary and said, Mary had an inquiring mind and that she was full of faith. She believed what the angel said, and that she had a willing heart. Now, this morning, uh, I hope we're all coming with those three. An inquiring mind. I've got a little bit of mind stretching for us a little bit later on, okay? And uh, I hope we're coming with uh, full of faith. But if we're not, then I'm hoping I can give you just something to um, uh, just encourage our faith a little bit. I'm going to wear my apologetics hat just for a few minutes, if that's okay. Um, and a, a willing heart. But you know, there's only, it's only myself that can supply the willing heart, that I'm willing to go God's way. And that's one of the things I'm talking about today, is to be going God's way. Now, um, we just, uh, this week, we're starting a series on the names of God. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to be looking at a few of the names of God that are revealed in the scriptures. Now, of course, we can't do all 101 of them. I think there are 101. Certainly in the index of a book I looked at, there are 101 names of God revealed in the scriptures. Uh, but we're going to look at some key ones to help us, to build us up, uh, to strengthen us as believers. And I'll probably look at about two or three this morning. Now, names in the scriptures are very important. Because they, God names people to give us some indication. Are we not on? Is that better? Okay, thank you. God, God gives us names to, uh, uh, to show us, uh, a certain people in the Bible, show us what their characteristics are. And he certainly names himself many, many times. Because he says, uh, look, uh, I am the Lord, your healer. I am the Lord, your provider. I am the Lord, your righteousness. All these things are, are the things that are innate in God, that are his qualities, and reveal to us what God is like. You know, we wouldn't know if he hadn't shown us in the scripture what he's like. But he reveals himself. He's a God who reveals himself, who tells us what sort of a God he is. And so we can look at these names, and it, you know, it really helps our faith because... Um, if we know that God is a healer, then we can go to him with confidence. Lord, you're my healer, my doctor. You know, it's sometimes easier to believe in the character of God than in his promises. You know, he, he says uh, in the scriptures, it's, uh, he healed all my diseases. But it, it's easier sometimes for us to think, well, okay, that's, that's what he's like. When Jesus came, he was a healer. And he healed people. So I can go to him with confidence. And you know, when the angel um, named Jesus to Joseph, and Joseph heard the, the, about the birth of Jesus in the dream, his, uh, the angel said to him, you'll call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And Jesus, as we've been singing about so wonderfully today, Jesus is the saviour. He is the one who has come uniquely into this world. God as man. I won't say too much about that because I think that's uh, Gerwin's talk for next week. But uh, before we get into the names of God, I just want to show you a few pictures. Okay, so I've got a picture for you. And I'm hoping the media team could just put the first one up, please. Thank you. Now, I don't know if you recognize this. Hey, Paul, do you know where this is? <laughs> Oh, you don't? <laughs> it's somewhere in America, that's right. Okay. Everybody knows, yes. 
<laughs> Where is it? Larry, I've been all over the United States. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's from Colorado. Okay. Uh, right. I, I'm not too sure, actually, to be honest, <laughs> if that's where it really is. But um, this is an interesting point. Um, you're quite right, it's in the mountains, okay? It's right high up in the mountains. It's called the Great Divide because that is where the rivers, that's a, the, these are the mountains where the rivers flow, uh, some into, eventually into the Caribbean, some into the Pacific, okay? But I just want you to imagine a, a raindrop falling on, one, on the top of one of those mountains, okay? And it falls, um, and then it, it kind of has a, a choice as to which way to go. And uh, it can either drip down that way uh, into the uh, Caribbean or that way down into the Pacific. Have we got that uh, that's up there? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Uh, imagine two raindrops. And one of them uh, eventually goes down the Snake River and ends up in the... Um, uh, in the Pacific, and the other one right down the Missouri, Mississippi, down into the Caribbean. Long journeys. But at, at, the, at the point where those two raindrops fall, they're very close together. But, you know, I was just thinking that, that the way that they, as, as it were, decide to go determines their whole, the whole course of their life. And, uh, you know, just for a few minutes, hours, uh, there's not much change. The terrain's very similar. It's mountainous and they're going down. But eventually, forces take over. Gravity takes over. And they're impelled to go one way or the other. And that moment on the tip of the mountain makes all the difference. And, you know, that's what it's like for us, isn't it, sometimes? That... Um, we have a choice. We're there on the tip of the mountain. Do I go that way or do I go that way? How do I know which way to go? Am I going to go God's way or am I going to go what seems best to me? And uh, th there are times in all our lives when we have to make these kind of decisions. But of course there's a very important and most important decision that we make right at the beginning of our Christian life. Am I going to accept Jesus as my saviour? Am I going to make him Lord of my life? And then consequently, throughout my life, am I going to go Jesus' way or am I going to go my way? And very often my way leads down the rocky slopes and in the wrong direction. Well, here we've got a guy who's, um, I think we've got him there, yes? Well, he's enjoying himself. Uh, he's going down his side of the mountain. Okay. Um, and for a while, things seem to go very well. Uh, but then, unfortunately, disaster strikes. <laughs> uh, and the scripture that I've put there is, there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. And the scripture is very clear that there are choices to make and there's an important choice that we have to make that will end either in life or death. Choose life, God says. The scripture says, choose life. Choose life. But there is a way that ends in death. Now I want to talk about choices a little bit later on. But, um, you know, it's not just individuals that have to make this kind of choice. We, th these choices are made for, uh, sometimes for us, sometimes by us, as a society. You know, it's, it, uh, well, my grandparents, anyway, would not recognize the society that we live in today. They would th actually think the world's gone mad in some respects. Not, it won't be, obviously the technology is very different and life's, uh, the way we live our lives is very different and in many ways so much better and more comfortable and easier. But there's, in other respects, morally, our attitudes to sexual purity and marriage, gender, our attitudes to authority, 
Everything seems to be changing radically. It's as if society is going down the wrong side of the mountain as far as we're concerned. So I'm just wondering, you know, is, is there a, a divide, a great divide? Is there a place where, um, you know, a society even has to decide which way it's going? And uh, I believe there is. I believe it's really fundamental to uh, our, even our existence, but certainly our, the way we live as, as a, a society. And it's strangely enough, it's in the first verse of the Bible. This is where it all begins. In the beginning, God. God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, this is where we start. Do we believe, as a society, do we believe as individuals? really believe that there is a God? Do we include God in all our decisions? When we're poised on the top of the mountain, do we go, do we think, well, okay, Lord, which way would you have me go? Which is, which is the best direction for my life? Which is the best way to, the best decision? Um, many years ago, that there was a book written, and I think people still wear those bracelets. What would Jesus do? You know, a, a key question in our lives. You know, what is God's way for me? Where do I go uh, at, at this particular point? Well, the first step really is to acknowledge God. This is his first name, the name I want to bring out. You thought I'd never get there, but here we are. God is creator. He's the creator. You know, because he's the creator, he, he made it all and he knows how it all works. He knows how society should run. He knows what's best for us all. And, you know, he's laid down the laws that this world is governed by. Sometimes we don't like them. Certainly as a society, we tend to uh, react against them. And sometimes we think we know our own, that we think our own way is best. But God's way is always going to be the best because he is the creator. He knows the way things work. You know, uh, uh, just before the winter came, I, I um, ordered a, a, a new heater, electric heater, just in case we need a little bit of uh, extra uh, warmth in some of the cold spots. And uh, I plug it in and switch it on, and it was all singing, all dancing thing, with a little digital display and all the rest of it, and uh, nothing happened. You know, you tend to think, well, I just plug it in, switch it on, press a button, and, and nothing happened. And then and I noticed about six different buttons there. So I tried one, two, three, and I tried to, uh, couldn't get it to go at all. So, uh, well, didn't want to take it back to Argos. So what, what, I, what I actually did, strangely enough, I should have done this in the first place, was to get out the manufacturer's instruction book. And there it was. You press that one, and you press that one. Bingo. Plenty of heat. You know, the manufacturer knows how to work what he's created. And God knows. He knows the best way for us. So often we pull against it. But his way is going to be the best way. Because he is the creator. He sets the standards for our lives. He knows what makes things work. And really, as individuals and as a society, we ignore these at our peril. God's not trying to spoil your fun. It might sound obvious, but he's not trying to spoil our fun. He's trying to give us the best things in life, the scripture says that, that he, God gives us richly all that we need for our enjoyment. Following his way is always going to be the best. Uh, another little bit of a technical problem that I had recently was the, uh, that um, my internet kept cutting out. Now, this time, uh, I looked at a few things and Googled a few things, but I couldn't get it to work. So I actually rang up the um, uh, internet provider 
I'd had a nice lady on the other side, at the other end of the phone, and she's talking me through it and sorting it all out. And you know, sometimes we, we do need a little bit of help in life. We need somebody to explain the manufacturer's instructions. And, and that's, you know, that's our job as pastors, is, to, is to, uh, to help you understand, to build in the foundations of the Word of God. You know, Jesus said, I think we've been singing about it this morning, that uh, your very word, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. This book is so important in our lives. It is the maker's instructions. You know, I've probably heard this before, but uh, it's a Bible, B-I-B-L-E. Do you know what it stands for? Basic instructions before leaving earth, okay? It's important that we follow the manufacturer's instructions. The creator knows what makes things work. Um, and, you know, to know him as creator is such a wonderful thing. I, I just, just take a little aside for a minute. You know, he made it all. And I, I, just can't, I just can't fathom how people can think it all arose by chance. It, it's it's the, the, uh, the whole mechanisms of the human body, when you think about it, you know, nervous system, electrical systems, hormonal systems, um, chemical systems, organs that function perfectly, as if this could have just arisen stage by stage over eons of time. It, it just defies belief. You've got to have more faith to believe that than you have to believe that there's a God behind it all. The Bible actually says, doesn't it, that, you know, um, the, the things about God are known to us by the things that he's made. The, 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 his invisible qualities are known, are made obvious. And somehow we have to be willingly, willingly ignorant. We have to kind of, and it's, it's really a spiritual kind of uh, thing that, that we, we think, mm, I don't, there's something inside us when we're, you know, we come into this world with a nature that actually is biased against God. And we have to learn to, uh, you know, teach ourselves and discipline ourselves to go his way. I want to come on to that a little bit, long, a little bit later. Um, but, you know, as we, um, if we really believe um, that God is the creator, then it will affect so many things that we, um, so many of these hot topics, if you like, that are, are bandied about in, uh, in society today. I'll just have the next slide, please, just to show us some of the things that stem from believing in God the Creator. I'm not going to go through all those. You can look at them. You know, there's racism there. Now, what, what, if, if we believe that, as Scripture says, that God made from one blood all mankind, then there's only one race. It's the human race. Okay? That deals with the whole issue of racism. The whole issue of gender. God made them in the beginning, male and female. The whole issue of marriage, all these things that are being um, challenged today are really challenges to create a God. Societies and the secularists and the humanists are challenging the fact that there is a God who has made this world and has set it up according to a plan. And it's not up to us to make our own choices about these things. It, he has said what is true about each one of these things that you can see behind me. Well, uh, if you want to know more about this, um, uh, Emily and I did a series on uh, the early chapters of Genesis. Um, one thing that uh, just comes to mind is, you know, this whole push towards globalism today. You know, if, I, I don't know if you realize this, but God actually is against globalism and a one world government which is where the push is going in society, if you hadn't, didn't realize. Um, it, he, God has set up nations until Jesus returns, then we'll have a global government. You see, all these things, these practical things, these um, things that are being bandied about, stem from the fact that there is a God. You know, we're on the top of the mountain, do we believe there is a God or not? And it, it's, to start with, you can make a choice and say, well, I don't believe in a God, 
And to start with, things seem okay. You know, the terrain isn't changing very much. We're wandering down. We're enjoying the ride. But actually, in the end, as that scripture said, there's a totally different, um, a, a totally different destination for us as a society and as individuals. Well, can we really trust this book as the maker's handbook? There have been so many challenges to it today. And, you know, if you've got genuine questions, I don't want to spend too long on this issue, but if you've got genuine questions, we've put some articles on the website. And you can, there are some articles you can read, fairly short, and just outlining the basic principles. Can we trust the Bible? You know, are the documents reliable? All these kind of things. You know, what about um, evolution? And do, did it really happen? Um, and, you know, we're, we're challenging there uh, the current worldview, uh, the secular worldview, and trying to show how important it is that we have a, a, a Christian worldview based on the scriptures. If we, if we are going to work as people, and if our society is going to work, if we're going to put things uh, in the, uh, if, we're going to, uh, if things are going to go according to the instructions in the maker's handbook. Well, is this really the maker's handbook? Is there anything I can give you this morning which will kind of indicate at least, and perhaps give you some ammunition when you're talking to non-Christians? Is there something which, uh, uh, in, uh, that we can say, well, this really shows, this has the fingerprints of the creator. Well, I'd like to put up my next slide, please. That's Ken. Uh, I don't know if you recognize this gentleman. It's not God in heaven, okay, with a white beard or whatever, as some people think. Um, it's, uh, who is it? Yeah, everybody knows. Al Albert Einstein, right? Now, he, uh, it, brilliant uh, Brilliant guy. Uh, I don't understand his theory of relativity. You can put up the next slide for me, please. Uh, but this is what it kind of summarizes to. But the interesting thing is that um, what Einstein sort of demonstrated was that time isn't a separate thing from matter and space. Now, I don't fully understand that. But actually, I do know that time will go at a different pace if, you, um, uh, if, you, uh, if you're going at one speed or another or if you're, got, if you're in a gravitational field or something. Um, so um, I've forgotten the figures for this. I used to do this with my sixth form students. You know, if, if, if I sat Natalie on a spaceship um, for, and, and so <laughs> we, we send her away from Earth to the nearest star and bring her back again at the speed of light pretty well. So it wouldn't take too long, it take about eight years, I think. So we, we say goodbye to you for eight years. When, when she comes back, Reese will be dead. And we'll all be gone, if the Lord hasn't come. And uh, about three or four hundred years will have passed. Because time travels differently at different, at different um, speeds, okay? And clocks on top of a mountain in a, uh, in a sort of, sort of, you know, high mountain in the Rocky Mountains will go a slightly different time from the ones down at uh, ocean level. Because time, and this is the point, time is part of what God created. Okay? So God is not part of his creation. Time isn't, God isn't part of time. So, the, for, instance, for instance, that question that people often ask us, oh, who made God? If God made the world, who made God? Well, nobody, because God, there wasn't a beginning. You know, it says in that, that verse, in the beginning. God created the beginning. He created time. So he's outside of time, okay? And it means, and if you have the next slide, I think it might just help. Um, yeah. For I alone am God, and there is none like me, only I can tell you the future before it even happens. That's in Isaiah. See, the scripture says that God can see the future. Because he's outside of time, he doesn't see, experience time like we do. Well, it's wonderful, actually. Um, it's, it's a bit like, um, you know, if, if, if you're watching a, a video, okay, and um, you're, you're not in the same time frame as, as a video, because you can pause it, stop, go and make a cup of tea, and, and come back again, 
and uh, whatever you're watching, you know, just continuing on at exactly the same minute that you, that you stop. So if you're wondering how God can talk to you and answer your prayers, and, and my prayers, and everybody else's prayers at the same time, well, uh, he can sort of listen to me, he can pause the video, and then he can go and look at some, listen to somebody else. Because he's, he's outside of the time frame. Okay, I don't know if that, But the important thing is, just for our, our, our study this morning, is that God is outside of time. Okay, he created time. So he can see the end from the beginning. So what fingerprints would you expect in his word, in, 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 his, in the maker's handbook? What would be the fingerprints that you would expect? This obviously has come from a, a supernatural being who is outside of time. It would be the ability to see the future. Now, I want to move fairly quickly through this, but I just want to show you that actually the scriptures are, this is a supernatural book. And as such, it has the fingerprints of the Creator. It is authoritative. It is the Word of God. It is the standard for our lives. Now, um, there are, I think, over 200 prophecies about the life of Jesus in the Scriptures. Now, I'm just going to put eight of those up, if we can have the next slide. There we are. Now, just wondering what the chances of eight of those being fulfilled, but just by random chance, most of those are, would be outside the control of the person uh, concerned. So where he was born, he wouldn't have that, opp he wouldn't have, uh, that uh, opportunity to d decide for himself and so on. What would be the chances of those uh, prophecies, just eight of them out of over 200 being fulfilled? Well, the answer is this. So next slide, please. Very big number. What's the... Uh, how would you describe that, Hayden? What is it? You know, <laughs> a rather large. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I've got it down here. I had to write it down. Wait a minute. Uh, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's a hundred quadrillion. All right, a hundred quadrillion. What are the chances of being that being fulfilled by chance? Somebody's calculated this. Don't ask me how. One in a hundred quadrillion. Now then, what are the chances of being killed by lightning? One, one in two million, okay? Not a hundred quadrillion, one in two million if you've been killed by lightning. That's pretty scary, isn't it, uh, apparently. Chance of winning a lottery, the most difficult lottery, would be one in 500 million. This is an enormous figure just for eight prophecies. You know, if people say, oh, they just happen by random chance, it's impossible. Absolutely impossible. And I just want a bit, bit of fun with you now, just to sort of explain a little bit more. So if we can have the next slide. Um, this is a picture of a million dollars, okay? Um, now, uh, I've got to do it in dollars because that's where the illustration is coming from. I think they were trying to illustrate the, 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 the enormity of the debt of the United States, but anyway, it's, it's, uh, we won't worry about that. Um, so, you know, what would be your chances of locating one serial number out of those. Pretty slim. You'd probably have a go just to see, but I don't think you'd have much hope. That's only a million. Uh, let's look at the next one. This is a hundred million dollars. Okay? That's uh, how many noughts? That's uh, uh, eight, eight noughts. Okay? What about a trillion? So next one, that's a trillion dollars, thin notes, okay. Can you see the um, articulated uh, truck there? Um, that gives you some idea. The next one shows you also what it's like to, next to a, a jumbo jet. And that's only one trillion, okay. Let's look at the next one, which is uh, 114.5 trillion dollars. I think this is probably the, the debt of the United States, I don't know. But you can see that tall thing on the left there, sorry, on the right, is um, that's a pile of a trillion dollars. Now, what are your chances of picking out one note from that? It's just enormous. It's ridiculous. And there's the chances of eight uh, scriptures from Jesus being fulfilled like that will be nine times that, the size of that pile. The fingerprints of the Creator with, are, are there in the Scriptures. So many prophecies, some being fulfilled today concerning the nation of Israel. So uh, we're getting ready for Jesus' return.
So, you know, we can really trust this as the, the maker's handbook. Now, I need to move on really quickly. So, uh, um, but, you know, you can see from, from this that God is our creator, that he, and knowing that, knowing that he made the world, knowing that he knows how it works, knowing that he can guide us through our lives, gives us real stability. You know, we start from a point where other people are still thrashing about. What's this world about? You know, what, what's it, what, what, you know, all this question about what's marriage, what's gender, what's race. These things are, are decided by the Lord God himself. Okay. Uh, but also, I have to remember that God is our judge. And that although we can make decisions now, later in a, uh, there comes a point where uh, it says in the scriptures that people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So, you know, we have to take this seriously. If there is a God, then ultimately in the end, we will have to give an account of our lives to him. Now, I want to look at this, uh, our key verse, just very quickly, because this is so important. Uh, a, a, little bit, uh, a little bit more detail. I put the Hebrew up there, not because I can r read or understand Hebrew really, but um, it, just to uh, uh, give you a, an indication. But the, I just wanted to look at the words because there's, there's something wonderful still in this verse that uh, we've not pulled out this morning. And here we are. Uh, Rashid Elohim, oh, I think it's the other way around in the Hebrew, but uh, Bara Elohim Shamaim et Eretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if we look at these words, the word for God there is Elohim. And that's an interesting um, form of that word because it's plural. It's, it's not singular, it's not God actually, it's sort of God's, as it were. So perhaps we can have the next slide up, please, just to see this. God is plural, but the, the, the verb that is, just, is uh, indicating what God uh, did, did is singular. So although it doesn't teach us this fundamentally, uh, I mean kind of ob absolutely obviously, but it does allow for the fact that here, right at the beginning, we have a very interesting uh, description, interesting name for who God is and what he's like. Because uh, he's both singular and plural. Now, it's not surprising we can't understand what God is like in our heads. We can't get our heads around this. So I don't worry about it. I'm not concerned that I can't understand it. But the truth is that he is both singular and plural. That he's one God in three persons. What we call the Holy Trinity. Now, there's, there's something wonderful here. The scripture clearly teaches this. It's, uh, you know, Jesus said that he was with the Father uh, before the world began. And uh, he said, that I, I am. He used the word I am for himself, which is the name of God. Um, and, uh, of course, the, so these are the three persons that, uh, if you like, we, we can't really describe it like this, but compose God. These are the three persons. One person, but three. Uh, well, one God, but three persons. Okay? The Holy Trinity. Now, there, there we are that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, before time began, there they were. Now, this is, this is the wonder of it, because that, at the very heart of what life is all about, at the very heart of creation, if you like, is, is a God of love. If he'd just been singular, if he'd been a monad, if you like, that he couldn't love because he wouldn't have anybody to love. But the, the Trinity, Godhead, is, is a community of love. And that is what he's like. That is his very nature. That is a fundamental thing about the Lord God Almighty, that he's love. And that he loves you. And he loves me. And he wants to share that love with each one of us. He wants to invite us into that community of love. And he's, that invitation is there for each one of us today. You know, perhaps you've strayed away a little bit. Perhaps you've gone down the wrong side of the mountain. 
Perhaps you've made a few wrong decisions. Well, you can come back. Unlike our raindrops, which are impelled by gravity, there's a greater force for us to bring us back into that community of love. And you know, we're not born in that. We're not born as, as, as we're born with the invitation to come into that place. But uh, we're born um, in God's creation as part of his creation. But we have to make that decision ourselves to come into the circle of his love. And that invitation is there for each one of us. You know, as we draw near to God, he draws near to us. And I, I just believe God's inviting us today to come into that circle of his love to come in and to believe in him and to, to accept him as creator, to accept him as the one who knows how our lives work, uh, it, it, to accept him uh, as our Lord and Saviour. We were singing so wonderfully earlier about Jesus as Saviour. And um, I think, uh, you know, as I say, we're not, we're not born. We're actually born uh, in, in a way that is kind of with a heart that... It, isn't really wanting to go God's way but he wants us to make that decision to go his way to come into the the circle of his love and you know he made a way for that to happen and if I can have the next slide you see what I mean he made a way in a manger he made that way by sending his son who would eventually die on the cross for our sins, that that barrier that was there can be removed. I was saying about the blood of Jesus, that is the blood, because he paid the price, because he died on the cross, God, God's wrath was satisfied. It's, it's a wonderful thing that, uh, you know, when the angels came at Christmas time, they sang peace on earth, goodwill to men. Now, we haven't seen peace in the sense of political peace, but there is a peace. There is a peace which we can all enter into. And, you know, sometimes we, we stray away from it. We, uh, even if we've given our lives to Jesus, as most of us have, we stray away. We start to go the wrong direction. We start to go down the wrong side of that mountain. We, we kind of, um, you know, and to start with, you, you don't notice it. And uh, it, it's only as we go along that we realize, oh, help, I'm not, this isn't God's way. But you can, you can come back. And he, this morning, I just believe that he's drawing us with his love. He's drawing us back. Come, the Lord's saying, just come into that circle of love. Come under my authority. It's an authority of love. It's not a harsh authority. It's an authority of the Father to his children. It's, it's, a, it's a love that won't let us go. It's a, a love beyond understanding that he has for each one of us. So whether or not you've made that decision for Jesus, or perhaps you did and you need to make it again just to you know, come back up and go down his side of the mountain, as it were, then today you can do that. Today you can decide. And uh, the invitation is there for each one of us. I want to finish by reading another account of creation. And it speaks of Jesus uh, in the beginning. And this uh, account from John's Gospel describes him as the Word. But when you hear Word, it's, it's Jesus. In the beginning, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light, the true light that gives light to everyone, that light was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. 
he came to that which was his own. But his own did not receive him. Yet to all who receive him, to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born of natural descent, no, sorry, I beg your pardon. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, but born of God. And that's the invitation to each one of us today, that we can be born of God. We can be part of his family. We can be his children. And if we're already his children, to rejoice in that, to know that he's not angry with us, to know that he treats us as children. He's, uh, we've passed from death to life. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is a time when God is, at Christmas time, you know, God is inviting us all to follow after him, to make him Lord of our lives, to make him the center, you know, and I'm on that mountain. Am I gonna go, am I gonna put God in the picture? Am I gonna say yes to Jesus? Am I gonna say yes to him? Just, just bow our heads for a moment. Just believe that uh, you know, God's been speaking sometimes to some of us perhaps we haven't made that decision to the God who made us, about the God who made us and the God who rescued us, who made a way in a manger. Today you can give your heart to him afresh. It just says in the scriptures you believe in him and he gives you the right to become a child of God. Perhaps you strayed a little bit and you've gone down the wrong side of the mountain. You need to come back a little bit more. Then today you can make that decision. Yes, Lord, your way is best. You know the way. You know the way to go. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord that you are our maker, you are our creator. Lord, you gave us life, and you've given us new life in Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, we pray, to be those who follow after you, who go your way to do your will, and to see Jesus glorified in and through our lives. And we ask it in his name. Amen. <laughs>